All right, hello everyone and uh, welcome to Good Stuff. My name is Kevin Billy and I'm glad you can spend some time with us today. I am uh, I'm very happy here to, to join who I know you think will be a great guest, um, but I'm a little biased seeing how it is my best friend. But today's guest is head women's basketball coach at Ohio University, Bob Bolden. Good to have you, Bob. Thanks for coming on. Yeah, Kevin, thanks for having me. This is exciting. So uh, I guess tell our listeners just here uh, real quick, just a, a little snapshot of your career from when I used to uh, whoop on you back in the day at Walsh to, uh, to, to where you went from there in terms of coaching. Uh, I wish it was quick. There's a laundry list of schools, but I do. Um, I think that time at Walsh was, I think back on it fondly. It was, it was definitely, a, uh, definitely where it all started and oftentimes come, go back to that for me. Um, Spent a number of years as an assistant coach moving around the country to different states. Uh, finally got my first Division I head coaching job at Youngstown State, uh, which you find it hard to believe has been over 10 years ago now. Um, was there for three years, and then I'll be, if and when next season starts, will be my eighth season at Ohio. So um, I feel very fortunate to be where I am uh, professionally. Um, I love what I do, um, and, and it's you know, it all started back at Walsh when, when we would play ping pong and basketball and everything else. And uh, just that passion grew from there. Yeah, I think uh, we were fortunate enough to have a lot of success as players, but people don't know how, how much success we had on the ping pong table. That's that's maybe a small thing that they don't know about, right? I mean, I, I don't know. I didn't see the ping pong All-American team. Uh, but I, I got to believe we were on them somewhere. Speaking of that success, I mean, you've had a lot of personal success as a player. Um, and, and that is so false, what I said earlier. You almost made me quit basketball after those first two years of playing behind you. But as a player and now as a coach, like, what do you, what do you attribute that success to? Is, is there one thing? Is there multiple things? I think it's just the passion and love of the game. And I, you know, it doesn't mean that it's always been good or always been easy. I mean, it's been frustrated. And I know at times with, especially in coaching, I've been tempted just to walk away from it because it gets frustrating. But there's just a, there's a passion and for better or for worse, I have it. And, and I love the game. Um, you know, I was telling, I was worried that becoming a coach about, about 10 years ago, I had a thought that becoming a coach was ruining the passion for the game because I was seeing all of the insides of it and, and lost some of the, the joy you have as a spectator. You can just sit down, you can watch something um, and not really know exactly the inner goings behind it. Um, and, and I'm glad I didn't because I, I love it even more now. And I've learned to balance that. But, um, you know, when you, get, when you become a coach, you give up a little bit of your fandom. You know, it's hard to be a basketball fan and be a coach at the same time with the amount of time that it takes. But uh, I sure am glad I kept with it and, and very proud of where I am today. It's funny you mentioned that because all the years I coached, I remember we'd get to the March Madness of it all and fill out a bracket and people would always ask me, you know, well, who's going to win it? And what, I had zero idea because I didn't watch any throughout the course of the season. So, yeah, no um, idea. I know, yeah. I know a, an amazingly little amount about men's college basketball um, for someone who's my professional job is to coach women's college basketball. Um, you know, in the Mac, we don't play a lot of double headers. It's hard to see. I enjoy watching Jeff's team play. I watch some practice. I enjoy being around him. Um, but it's really, really hard to see his games. And um, and a lot of times after after watching tape, and you'll understand this, um, you know, in the amount of tape you watch and preparing for your games and then the amount of tape you watch your team playing, uh, sometimes the last thing you want to do is watch another basketball game in the middle right. of February. Um, yeah, I think that's why I became such a fan of the NBA. Um, the NBA finals and playoffs come at the perfect time. You know, you get a chance to decompress from the season. Um, and then you start to miss it a little bit. Right. And, and then you get to you get the, the best of all basketball. Right. We get the greatest players in the world playing their hardest and best and, and things of that sort. So uh, the NBA has become a real I've, been, I've become a real fan of the NBA, I should say. Yeah, I, I can sympathize with that. Now, you talked a little bit earlier about frustrations. Where, where, has, where has failure for you, maybe individually, whether that's been as a player, a coach, or just being a part of a team, where has that fit into this whole process? Well, I think that's just – I think that's defined who I, who I am. I think, you know, even high school, um, 
I, I was a, I ended up being a point guard in college, but um, when I was an eighth grader, I was told to pass the basketball to a ball handler and run down the floor and mm-hmm. essentially be a post player. Cause I was tall by, by Louisville standards, by no other standards was I tall, <laughs> but by Louisville high school standards, I was tall. Um, and that just kind of drove me to, to prove to that person that, you know what, I, I can dribble the basketball. Okay. Um, you know, and, and, and when you get to Walsh and, they're like, oh, this is just an NAI school. This won't just be no big deal. And then you see the players that you're playing with and against, and you're like, oh, boy. And, and everything, you know, you had a bag of tricks that worked for you in high school, and then all of a sudden in college, nothing works. And, and you know, you're like, wow, I, I stink. You know what I mean? You, you commit there, and you think, well, I'm going to come in and play a lot. And then you get to the first open gym, and you're like, oh, geez, I, I, I don't know what I'm doing. Reality check. <laughs> yeah. And then you know, you the first couple games come and you get some minutes and you just keep fighting and fighting and fighting and until you get to where you want. And, you know, coaching's the same thing. I can't, I couldn't tell you how many coaching jobs I've applied for. I mean, it has to be over 200. I mean, I applied, I applied, applied, applied. And, and looking back, I realized I applied for some jobs that I had zero chance of getting. Didn't know at the time, but in retrospect, it's like, well, of course you can get that job. Um, you know, get close a couple times and you don't get it. And, and that's heartbreaking. And that was, I always knew I wanted to be a head coach and it was a long windy path to get there. And and I'm glad I made it. Um, But, you know, even the beginning of that, our first year at Youngstown, we were terrible. You know, we won five or six games or something like that. And you're like, gosh, maybe I'm not a division one coach. And and you just have to keep, you have to keep figuring it out. Um, And I think the more you get into it and the more it becomes your livelihood, the more important it becomes to you to figure it out. Yeah, so true. I, I think a lot of that resiliency or pers- persistence that you display. Um, what, what would be some other characteristics that you've been around? I mean, you've coached a lot of good players. You played with a lot of good players. What, what stands out to you? Like, what are what are some attributes that that are consistent amongst all of them? I'm mean, just. I don't know. If there's anything that's sad that I mean, talent goes a long way. Right. I mean, there's there's plenty of talented players and that that, you know, that truly does go a long way. Um, but having passion in what you do is is probably I don't want to say more important because you can't be terrible and try really hard and beat a guy that's good. Right. The good guy's going to win at some point. You have to have a you have to have a basic level of talent in your field to succeed. Um, but you got to have a whole lot of passion and desire and um, energy for what you do. and. I think that is as times when I've thought about getting out of coaching, I look at other professions and I just don't have the passion to do those things. It, it doesn't equal my passion to be a basketball coach. Right. Even, even the bad days and the frustration, I still have the energy and the passion to go out and try again tomorrow. Um, and I just, I don't think there's any, I don't, I don't think there's, you can't substitute that, that, that need, that's needed for success on any level at any, at any skill. And some of those things that you're talking about, I'm assuming that, that you, when you're recruiting, let's say, for example, and, and, and building this program and your team, uh, are you looking for those things specifically? Or are you looking for other things in addition to that when you're recruiting? Yeah, I mean, I think you're, you try to figure that out. And I think that is, in, in whatever you're recruiting for, that's going to be the hardest thing to uncover. Um, you know, because when you're recruiting for a basketball scholarship or a job position, um, you know, I'm interviewing an assistant coach for a job. I'm, I'm recruiting a basketball player. Uh, I have a limited amount of time to have a conversation with them, and they're probably going to be on their best behavior. So if they can't if they can't demonstrate some passion and energy in that short time period, then it's an easy no. You know what I mean? I think the no's are easier than the yeses. Um, because everybody can be on their best behavior for a short period of time. And, um, you know, recruiting, you know, when, when somebody has to hire for a job, they've got a, they've got a short time period, right? A couple of weeks, maybe a month, they're going to try to make a decision. Uh, recruiting sometimes takes up to a year, uh, year and a half, as you well know. So you get a little bit more opportunity to dive a little deeper, talk to different people, um, watch kids experience um, and display certain traits. Um, but I think, I think the no's are easier than the yeses. I think you find kids that are do things you're like, well, that's definitely not for us. Um, it's harder to get to the yeses, in my opinion. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, it's almost like I, I felt like towards the end of it when I was at the college, and, and that's been seven years now maybe, 
it's like that plain hard and that passion you're talking about that that almost became like that trader skill set you were looking for you know hey i'm going to go out and find a shooter i'm going to find a good ball handler that seems like that's one of those things that have changed over time have you noticed that or or what are some other things that you've noticed have changed since you you've started this i know you've been doing it a while but are are there certain things that stick out to you yeah 21 years now if you can believe that it's a long time the uh I think the biggest difference is when you, when I started, it was more of, we had a lot more players that did things because coach said to do them. Um, We have, we, we have very few players that do things because coach said to do them. Now we have more people that need a reason. Um, They need to know why they need, they need to know the why a lot more now than they've ever had before. Um, and I think if you're probably just starting and you've grown up in this generation, it's probably pretty easy for you because you think the same way. When you're, when you're 21 years in and you've had success doing it one way, um, you know, it becomes a challenge. And I think that's probably one of the best things at being at the college level is you're, you're constantly challenged to evolve. You know, these kids come in at 18 years old every single year. And, um, you know, they're generally a pretty progressive mindset. Um, on on social issues and things of that sort and you're constantly challenged to evolve and keep up with what's going on and new ways of communicating and um understanding what's important to them and and we've seen great coaches not be able to to do it right we've seen really good coaches kind of fall by the wayside later in their career because they're not able to change and and i can understand that you know because you've had success doing it one way um and then it changes you know, I, I think recruiting is a great example of that. No matter how much, how many years of recruiting you have, um, for me, next year will be different. The kids will be a different generation. Um, it probably will have nothing to do with a recruiting conversation that I had 10 or 15 years ago. You know, yeah. they, they have technology now we never had. We used to, and you'll remember this, you used to go to the office <laughs> on Sunday nights and you were glued to your office making phone calls Sunday right. nights. Right. That was the best time to get a hold of people. Mm-hmm. And now you're getting phone calls at any time. You know, you're getting FaceTime. You're getting everything at any time of the day. Like, in, it just is, it's a different world. And Yeah, when you got the answer machine, that wasn't a good, that wasn't a good thing on Sunday night, you know. <laughs> right, exactly. But, but like exactly. for, the, for the people that are listening, we, we've got a lot of people that are leaders or, or that are coaches um, and, and probably majority right now in high school, I'd say more. And so I'm, I can't expect you to relate to that without you not living it. But all these things that you're talking about go into building a team ultimately. Um, do you have any best practices or things that, that you've done well over the years that you could suggest to people? when it comes to this whole, because I think you bring up a great point, they, they want a why now. So, so what are some ways that they can, they can build a team regardless of the levels that they're at that you found to be successful? Well, you've got to get to know them. I mean, I, I learned that um, my first year at Youngstown, we ran really good stuff my first year of Youngstown, but my kids didn't care. Um, and quite frankly, I, think my, I don't think my kids thought I cared about them. And if, if your people don't think you care about them then it really doesn't matter how good your stuff is like it just doesn't matter you have to you have to take time to get to know your your people and and in my instance my people are my players but Mm -hmm. um you know you gotta you gotta figure out a way that you're going to connect with them um and as i mentioned in my situation and for high school coaches the same like you keep getting older and the kids do not the, the players are always the same. I'm dealing with 18 to 20 year olds, high school coaches. You're dealing with what? 14 to 18 year olds. Yeah. Um, and, but you're dealing with 14 to 18 year olds every year and you just keep getting older and you know, you're in your, you're 30, then you're 35 and you're 40 and you're 45 and you're 50. And those kids are still 15. And, and that age gap is growing and you really got to challenge yourself to figure out, you know, how are you going to, how are you going to communicate with them? Um, you know, there was a time where I'd get really upset if uh, I got a text from a kid as opposed to a phone call. Well, at this day and age, uh, there's, there's kids that, that if I didn't see them face to face in the gym, I wouldn't talk to them because they would only text me. And that's, that's their preferred, preferred mode of communication. And I, and I think we have to be cognizant of how the people we're trying to lead want to communicate and not always, well, I, don't, I want you to do it my way. 
um, I know you're a big believer in communication and in order for communication to work, it has to be effective. And if that's effective, if texting is more effective than calling, then we should be texting and, and we should be open to that idea of, okay, that's, you know, that, that's what is important to that kid. That's how that kid communicates with everybody else in his or her world. So we are going to have to be willing to adapt to them. And then I don't think uh, 15, 20 years ago, the players were expected to adapt to the coach. That was just the expectation. You, you wouldn't, you wouldn't dream of, uh, the kid would never text you back if you called them 15 right. years ago. But now that's, that's normal. That's and, normal. And I think it's up to us to adapt. And you know, we certainly have to have some standards that you're not going to bend on, but you have to be willing to be a little bit flexible. Um, and then I think the other thing is you have to realize you can't do it by yourself. I mean, I, I can't, I have, I have an amazing staff and you, you've heard me talk about them before. I mean, they've been with me for a long time and I'm, I'm, blessed to have them um, and I know that's not everybody's situation but uh, I've had a staff and, and they treat kids well and, and if you just in life if you just treat people well it'll just get you a lot further and, and coaching is no different. Yeah so you touched on a couple of things there which I think are really good I, I, and I'll, I'll go with the staff first and then we'll come back with kind of a leadership thing what are, what are some things and I know your staff you, you do have a great staff great people are there certain are there certain things that you're looking for in a staff? And and I know that maybe high schools, for example, once again can't have the same luxuries that you have. I mean, you're paying them and and so on and so forth. But there's got to be there's got to be certain things that you're looking for that 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 works at every level. And it, what would what would some of those things be? Yeah, the number one thing is if you're if you're coaching basketball, you just have to hire a good person because our game isn't that complicated. It's it's a it's a relatively simple game and you can, you can teach whatever strategy you want to teach. I mean, you could, a basketball person could learn the flex offense in 90 seconds, right? Right. right. The triangle offense. Now the intricacies, sure. There, there's some things that you'd get better at over time, but um, just from a, you know, if you and I were working on the same staff and if you were, if you were to hire me, and you wanted to teach me how to coach up with box and one or triangle and two or two, three, you could do that in a day. You know, you could teach me what you want me to teach to the players that I could learn that. Um, what you can't teach me is how to be a good person. And, and you need me as your assistant to be a good person. You need to be able to trust that when I'm talking to a player that I'm saying the right things and I'm not sabotaging your moral beliefs or your program or, you know, I'm not, I'm not giving the kid bad information. I'm treating the kid well. You know what I mean? Yep. That's all. Cause now that's all coming back on the leaders. That's coming back on the head coaches, the owners of businesses. Um, you know, this, this time of, Oh, I didn't know that that doesn't fly anymore with anybody. It's certainly, mm -hmm. except for a few NCA schools, that doesn't work. But for the rest of the world, the, I don't know card isn't working anymore. So you need to make sure that you surround yourself with good people. And I think you can do that at any level. Um, there's certainly a luxury for me that I get to hire full-time people that don't have the, a teaching responsibility and, you know, a study hall responsibility and, and all these other things that they're trying to get to, you know, my coaches are, are just coaches, but um, the quality of the person, I think you can find no matter what you're looking for. Yeah, I think that's really good. I, I agree with that. I kind of want the same philosophy. And what's nice is even when you're eventually out of coaching, like I am myself, is you, you have those those relationships that I think last and sustain over time. And and rather than being, I guess, coaches, they they become friends, right? So I think that's kind of a neat thing too in the in the in the fraternity, if you will. And and I think that goes back to that second point I, I wanted to hit on was the connection part. Um, I, I think it's. You know, you, you, you kind of alluded to the old adage of people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Um, what, what struggles when it comes to that? You know, when you're, when you're a leader, I guess maybe a two-part question with this is what components do you think you need as, as a leader? And then what struggles do you face within leadership now? Well, I, you know, you're going to – and for high school and college, the same. You're going to struggle – you're going to struggle getting the players to for it to be as important to the players as it is to you. And, and I, you know, you're always, everybody has two, three, five, 
an undisclosed amount of players that are really into it, man. They're just there. They're excited to be there. They're there early. They stay late. They're really into it. And everybody has about the same amount of kids that are showing up, um, what we would call compliant. They're going to come when you tell them to come. They're going to leave as soon as they can. They're not necessarily going to break any rules. They're not troublemakers, but they're not really that invested in it. They're going to do, they're going to do what you tell them to do. Um, and I think it, you know, as a, as a high school coach, you're, you're working another job and then you're, you're spending all your free time for a stipend to try to coach these kids. So it must be really important for you to do that. Or you would go spend time otherwise. You'd use that time otherwise because it takes up a ridiculous amount of time, you know, between practices and preparation and games. And, um, you know, same thing for, for college coaches. Like this is, this is our only way to make a living. Like it, you know what I mean? Like we don't get to fall back on teaching something else. Like this is it. If it doesn't work out enough games, we will get fired. And, and that just that that dynamic just instantly makes it more important to me than most of the players um, because it's a matter of how how I survive and my coaches survive. Um, so trying to trying to relay that importance and not that it's not trying to get them to realize it's important for you, but just trying to grasp the same level or a similar level of importance as to you know and and it comes down to the stuff they don't want to do right like rebounding and being in the right spot on defense and doing a lot of um unselfish acts those are the hard sells right i mean you can get anybody your best scorer is usually pretty into it right because he or she gets to take a lot of shots and that's really all kids want to do is shoot right um but you got to get the buy-in and for the other kids to make those other things feel important and i think that's probably the biggest challenge um, because there's not a big outcome. I mean, there's a, there's an end there's an end game that we could win a lot of games, and you'll really enjoy winning um, if you can get kids to believe that a they'll really enjoy winning, and b that you'll really get to that outcome. Otherwise, the young man, the young lady that you're asking to set screens and gets two points a game, it's hard to get a buy-in out of that person. Um, be, and and it's not. That person's probably pretty satisfied in their role within the team. It's just the second that person leaves the team, uh, the first thing that, that Aunt Susie asks is how many points did you score? Yeah, and all that hard work you put in about developing a teamwork just went down the drain with one question from one random person that may or may not know anything about the game of basketball. Yeah, now with, with three boys, as you know, and, and I think the majority of the time calling – uh, grandparents, because they, they come to all the games, but calling them afterwards and the first quote, well, did you guys win? They'll, they'll ask that usually. And then it's, well, how many points did you score? How many hits did you have? How many goals did you, you know, that's, that's where the emphasis, that's where the emphasis goes. So, well, now that you've been in this for, for a long period of time, uh, what is it still that, that motivates you? What, what inspires you? What, what gets you going? Uh, the players. I mean, I think, um, you know, the, the opportunity, the opportunity to work with them and build and like, you're just forever chasing. You're just trying to get the most out of that group. And it's interesting because it's not always the same, right? I mean, some groups should win 20 games. Some groups should win 12. Some are going to win 28. Um, You know, so you're just, you got that group and you just want to see if you can get them at, for us at, in March, did we win as many games as we could win? Did we provide this group with the best college experience that they could have? Um, and it's like, it, it's a never ending, it's a never ending deal. Cause you do it, you know, I think, you know, this year was a very strange ending, obviously. Um, last year was, was a pretty successful year for us. Um, and you do that and you feel really proud about what you've done and, you know, you take a couple of days off and then you start to miss it and you're like, all right, let's get ready for next year. And you start ramping it up and, you know, you start your spring workouts and some come up with a plan for summer and fall and before you know it, you're doing it again. And I think that's where the passion and drive really comes in because it is a, it's a grind. It can be a grind if you don't love it. If you love it, it's just it's just what you do. But if not, it can be a, it can be very taxing. 
yeah, for sure. It's, it's definitely a, a long process. I, I think that's the thing now being on a sports that people outside of sports appreciate about the people in sports is just the respect for that process and understanding the difference of seasons and what goes into them, if you will. Yeah. Yeah. And then you're just the, uh, you know, for us, the room always changes, you know, and you're looking at a team and, and you develop, um, because we play so many games and we travel together and spend so much time together, um, you know, you really develop a good relationship and then that's over and that changes. And it's always unique to me how two kids leaving and three kids coming or three kids leaving and two kids coming just can completely change the dynamic of a team. Um, you know, kids sometimes who were, were real super quiet, all of a sudden become more vocal. They feel more comfortable talking. Um, they got a better understanding of what's going on and they, you know, they're more familiar with the situation and they're more vocal. Um, it, it just, it's really, it's really a neat dynamic watching each turning kind of turnover and, um, you know, kind of speculating how you think it's going to go and then waiting to see if that is truly how it goes. And it's, it's interesting the times that it doesn't go uh, the way you think it's going to go. <laughs> Well, I can I can say I was about over twenty. Every year you write down at the beginning of the year what you think is going to happen, or you talk about it as a staff, and it, it just it never seemed to happen that way. But going back to the the impact um, in, in terms of I guess inspiring and motivating. When I asked you, impact being a big thing, you know, hopefully people are getting out of this. Can you can you go back in your lifetime, and are are there certain people that that definitely impacted you or 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 motivated you to to kind of be where you're at today and you find yourself maybe using some of those things as a coach, as a parent, whatever it might be. Yeah. I mean, I think I, obviously I was very fortunate to have two very supportive parents. Um, and um, that's where it all starts with me and it kind of grows from there and you come across new people. Um, you know, I think back to even, even when you and I met, you know, you, at that point you think you have things figured out and um you know we really we really are just two random guys that show up at a university two years apart from each other and um i've been able to forge a lifelong friendship out of it and you just you don't ever really know uh what turns and twists are going to come from it and i think that I look back, that was just a very formative time for me. And I think I'm fortunate because um, there were a lot of roads you can go down when you're 18, 19, 20, 22. Yeah, for sure. 26, <laughs> 30. <Yeah. laughs> um, and I think you got to be, you got to be fortunate for the people that helped take you down the road that you, that you ended up on. And, and I, I think I am, you know, I'm not, I don't have a ton of friends, but I have some really good ones, and I'm I'm certainly grateful for that. Um, coaching wise, Carl Smesco has been a big influence on what we do. Right. Um, you know, I worked for Carl, uh, I worked for Jody Kest, and I worked for Jerry Sheevy. Um, and that's a blessing. I mean, uh, Jody's the all-time winningest coach at the University of Akron. Carl and Jerry have both won national titles. Like that's just bizarre. Yeah. You know, who gets to do that as yeah, a right as a mentorship, you know, and I was young and at both Carl and Jerry, I was very young. So that was, that was, I was very impressionable at that point as well. And I, I think, um, I'm very proud of where I've come, but I'm, I'm, I'm not foolish to believe that it was just my brain that got me here. Right. It was emulating a lot of things that I saw. And, um, I think probably having the confidence to emulate them and not feel like I have to think of everything myself and just, you know, as I alluded to before, basketball is a pretty simple game. You don't have to you have to be super smart to be good at it. So, you know, don't be afraid to use other people's ideas and try to score one more point than the other team. Yeah, this is true. What um, uh, the one question I do like to ask is if you could go back to that 18 year old self or even 22 year old self, whatever it might be, what, what would you tell them now that you know what you know? Oh gosh, I don't know if I'd want to know what I know now when I was twenty. I think, I, I think part of the joy was just being blissfully ignorant and and thinking that you know, probably more. Well, you yeah, definitely thinking you know more than you truly do know. And and I think that that hits you in the face sometimes when you realize you were wrong. And I think that's what 
I think that's what molds us to who we are is how we react to that. You know, when you thought, yeah, I'm the, you know, I'm the best point guard in the gym. And then all of a sudden, I don't want to name any names, but you know, the kid from Central State just takes it from you and dunks it. And you're like, Oh, maybe I'm not, maybe I need to get better at that. And I, and I think those are, I don't think I would have wanted to know. Yeah. You know what? You're going to be all right. Cause I felt pretty bad after that game. And I, I don't think I would have wanted I don't think I would have got here if I had known, you know, that's going to be okay. Don't sweat it. Because exactly. I do think there's some things you should sweat. And, and um, looking back, obviously, there is not really as big a deal as you thought it was. But I think the way you handle that and respond and prepared yourself for the next game did matter. And, yeah, and it's ironic how many times we thought we were right and the coach was wrong. And then when we became coaches, we were right and the players were wrong, right? 100%. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's, that's what you're dealing with. And, right. um, and that was true. I don't think, I don't think I was a trouble kid to coach. I think I loved the game. I think I mostly did what the coaches said. Um, I certainly disagreed with the coach. Um, and, and so sometimes when I get frustrated, I just, I have to remember that they're 18, 19, 20 year old kids. Mm -hmm. They don't know what they think they know. And that's okay. You know what I mean? There's something about that passion and that youth and that excitement that you can tap into and, um, and really, and really make the most of it, I think. Well, just to, to bring some closure to this talk, I like to fire off what I would say uh, somewhat of a rapid fire, but three pointers. So I'm going to go inside out, crossover, and kick it to you on the wing here, and you can shoot a couple of threes. All right. I like that. Um, if people could only learn maybe one thing from this talk, uh, what, what would you want them to take away from it and, and kind of just hold on to? Treat people well. Nothing more important than treating people well. Good. Um, and then what is, and don't dodge this one, uh, what, if you could step into my shoes, what's one thing you would have asked today that I did not ask? Oh, goodness. Um, I'm surprised you didn't ask about the difference between coaching men and women. Okay. Yeah. Having both of us played men's college basketball and, and been around it. And I know you and I have talked about that at length. Um, I thought that question was coming. Yeah. It's probably an assumption or a conversation that's already happened, right? Yeah, we've um, had it a dozen times, but if uh, obviously you're paying attention at the beginning, and, and it's a phrase that I have a tendency to say a lot, good stuff, hence the name of this. What would be some some good stuff that that you could give us in closing? Anything you feel appropriate for the time being, or just in general? Um, yeah, I mean, I I just I can't stress enough that just just have passion for what you're doing because you're doing it. And it may not be, it may not be what you want to do in 10 years or five years, but you're doing it at the moment. So I, I don't, I often challenge our kids, just do the best you can. I, I don't see any reason to not, it, whether it's, you know, in your relationships or your schoolwork or your sport, or, you know, you're a basketball player, but you're playing baseball for fun, then, then try to be the best baseball player you can be for, you know, two, three months or whatever it would be. Um, and I think, I, I think there's a, there's a lot of value in just trying your best and, and understanding that you're going to fail. You can't possibly be the best at everything. And that's okay, too. Um, that's quite okay. That would go back to explain the success and the trials and tribulations of all the ping pong, right? Yes, that's right. There is a lot of failure. Yeah. Uh, so where, where can our listeners kind of connect with you or find out a little bit more uh, about uh, the Ohio women's basketball team? Well, our OhioBobcats.com is our website. Check us out. Um, you know, we'd love to see you, at the, see you at a game, whether it's in Athens or, you know, throughout the Midwest as we, as we travel through conference and non-conference season. We'd love to see you there. Well, hey, I appreciate you taking the time today. I know, uh, I know we talk a lot, but this is our first official Zoom call. And so uh, it was good. And I know it's going to be really good for everybody else. Once again, I know I'm biased, but – uh, I think you do an unbelievable job. And we probably should have talked a little bit about that Ohio State win this year and a lot of the other Big Ten wins since you've been there at OU. But uh, I think you're one of the best basketball minds out there and, and obviously uh, a much better person than that. So I'm sure everyone can take something from us today. So thanks so much for being here today. Yep. Thank you, Kevin. I love what you're doing. Hey, it's, uh, I think as I close always, it's, it's one thing to, to listen to this message and it's another to take it and, and apply it somehow. So uh, hopefully you're able to do that. So. Until next time, good stuff.